I was asked by the Wallace Stevens Society to put together a panel, something having to do with contemporary poets and contemporary poetry and poetics. And I asked the Wallace Stevens Society folks, um, my friends Lisa Goldfarb and um, Bart Akut, who together run the Wallace Stevens Society, which is an organization I'm part of and respect a lot, um, if it would be all right if I would invite, if I could invite practicing poets, four practicing poets, who they're also theorists and critics and literary historians, but poets who um, may or may not have any kind of close affinity with Stevens, may not have, I wasn't even aware that, I think except in Alden's case, whose first book was about Stevens, but has moved on and done, you, you wouldn't consider him a Stevensian. Um, but for the most part, people who don't have a close connection to Stevens, who aren't known as Stevensian poets, certainly, um, and who are not going to be on the roster of a conference about Wallace Stevens. Um, what better way to think about whether Stevens has relevance or a place in contemporary poetry than to not quite randomly <laughs> invite four people whose poetry I have read and respect to see what they have to say. Um, in the spirit of that mode, let's see what happens. Our format will be that. It won't be, uh, I, I like to think, typical of an MLA panel. There are no papers, there are no lectures, and there are no, not even mini lectures. There might be a mini performance somewhere, but not a mini, mini lecture. That is to say, our hope is, uh, aside from my own attempts at um, steering the conversation to some poems, some references to some poems, I'll explain that in a minute, that we have picked out that we could talk about, uh, just to see what happens with the five of us as we move along in the conversation. Um, so that's the format. It will be improvised. There's very little in the way of preparation and a, a note taking, other than several of us talking with each other. And recently, in the last hour, we had a, an hour-long recorded conversation about one of Stephen's poems. What I asked these folks to do, and I'm going to introduce them briefly each in a second, was to pick out two poems each that would, in a positive or possibly negative way, I don't know, I don't know yet, um, allow them to say something about their relationship to Stevens. Two poems each. Uh, and one of the questions I might simply ask is, well, why, why that poem? What's, what's the point of that poem? What, what, how does that poem speak to you? And I, I framed a couple of the initial questions in that regard. Um, so Alda Nielsen, I'm going to introduce him more in a second, sitting way off to my far right there, uh, chose three sections or cantos of The Man with the Blue Guitar. Uh, Kate Colby here uh, chose The Motive for Metaphor and the Final Soliloquy of the Interior Paramour, a, a poem a lot of us know. Um, Ty Tyrone Williams uh, chose a, a little known poem called Theory and another called The Dwarf. Um, and Monica De La Torre chose so-and-so reclining on her couch, one of my favorite poems, um, and Man Carrying Thing, which has a sort of famous tagline. Um, I added a poem that I've been thinking a lot about called No Possum, No Sop, No Taters, which is a kind of snowman poem updated to a time of actual privation during World War II. Um, and then the five of us just recently talked about the 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 poem that took the place of a mountain, we might add that one in. We're not even sure if all those poems are going to be talked about. So um, Alan Nielsen, a poet, critic, editor, literary historian down there, uh, whose books include uh, What I Say, Innovative Poetry by Black Writers in America, a book called Trey, which I deeply am uh, admire, which is in part about Trayvon Martin, um, a, a Brand New Beggar, uh, poems of and about blues travelers. You didn't hear this from me. C.L.R. James, a critical introduction. Black chant, languages of African American postmodernism. And recently, I'm pleased to say, with Laura Verana, has co-edited finally the collected poems of Lorenzo Thomas, published by Wesleyan this past October. Monica De La Torre, right here, a poet, translator, scholar, born and raised in Mexico City, who's been, who's edited Bomb Magazine, The Brooklyn Rail whose poetry collections include public domain, talk shows, and a book called The Happy End, All Welcome, who has taught at Brown University and now has recently joined the faculty of Brooklyn College, yay. Uh, Tyrone Williams, uh, 
uh, among whose many books of poetry are On Spec, The Hero, Project of the Century, Adventure of Pi, uh, C.C. Howell, who teaches literature and theory at Xavier University in Cincinnati, who's the editor of African American Literature Revised Edition, and whose new book is As Is. Highly recommended. Who published that, Tyrone? Omnidon. Omnidon, as is, poems about Islam and the West that form a meditation on the vacillation between betweenness and amongness. And Kate Colby, just to my right here, who has recently put out two books, The Arrangements, about a year ago or so, and Dreams, Dream of the Trenches, a book of literary essays um, from Naomi Press that was a staff pick at the Paris Review, and they made the right choice whose long essay about pigment and not writing about Charles Olson, um, which she wrote as a Harvard Woodbury Fellow, is currently in the Chicago Review, or is about to be this month, I think, and who has taken up the role of book editor at SA Press and teaches at Brown University. Um, well, OK. So Monica, you picked man carrying things. Mm -hmm. OK. And it begins famously. Does anyone remember that, the, the big first lines? The poem must resist the intelligence almost successfully. Mm -hmm. So my opening question, yeah. and it's not just to you, but to anybody who wants to respond to this idea of Stevens, uh, the poem must resist the intelligence almost successfully. Why? What's he contending? Do you agree? Why is that interesting to you? It's a very interesting poem to me because it took me a long time to realize that I was tricked by that adage you just quoted. So the tricked. poem, yes, the poem was resist the intelligence almost successfully. So I kind of misread it numerous times, thinking that the what the line was saying was that the po the poem is victorious over the intelligence because it's stated negatively. And after thinking about it a number of times, I realized, oh, the poem must resist the intelligence almost successfully, meaning that intelligence is victorious over the poem. But I love the fact that there's uh, instantly um, um, a resistance or a contention between those two things established. Um, I personally would argue in my own poet, in my own poetic stance, that um, I, I like poems that resist the intelligence successfully. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a but, big difference, Monica, between your position and Stevens? Because the almost sounds like it's a big deal to you. It's a big deal. Yeah. It's a big, it, right. Yes, I'm splitting hairs for sure. I'm splitting hairs. But it's a poem that is also splitting hairs. Um, Can we read it since it's yeah. not that long? OK, but we're sure. not going to read all these poems because <laughs> it'll take too long. But I'll, I'll be happy to read it. Mm -hmm. uh, but just this once. Um, the poem must resist the intelligence almost successfully. Illustration, a broom figure in winter evening resists identity. The thing he carries, poem's called Man Carrying Thing. The thing he carries resists the most necessitous sense. Accept them, then, as secondary. Parts night, not quite, this is a long parenthesis, by the way, that's happening here. Parts night, not quite perceived of the obvious whole, uncertain particles of the certain solid, the primary free from doubt, things floating like the first hundred flakes of snow out of a storm we must endure all night, out of a storm of secondary things, end of parenthesis, a horror of thoughts that suddenly are real. We must endure our thoughts all night until the bright, obvious stands motionless in cold. Monica, back to you. Mm -hmm. So the, the ending there is that usual Stevens thing, that fantasy that somewhere along the line, usually it's in the middle of winter, a, what we were talking about, the sort of exact rock, mm -hmm. the language works, will appear, but mostly not. How do you feel about mm -hmm. that? And I'm going to ask some of the others what they think about all this. Right. So to go back to what I was saying, and it relates to your question now, um, the, I, I, I wanted this to be a poem that actually advocates for indeterminacy. Yep. And it flirts with indeterminacy <clears throat> and uh, 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 acknowledges and highlights the appeal of indeterminacy, but ends up handing it over to reality. Because Tyrone or Kate or Alden Stevens can never quite give up that 
cherished idea that somewhere along the line language can work and he can point to the world successfully? Well, he Kate? has it. Um, he wants it both ways here. Because in the middle, it has this kind of quantum sensibility or like it's like a Schrodinger's cat where uncertain particles of the certain solid, he, he kind of keeps them both in the air where there's both certainty mm. and uncertainty at mm. once. Mm. Um, so while he's willing to concede that he can't nail down the truth and the hard facts of you know, everything he's trying to get at, um, he, uh, he leaves some room for that to still exist at mm. the same time as this. Monica, can you restate the difference between you and Stevens and I'll ask Tyrone and Alan to respond to that, whether they share that disagreement. I like poems that resist the intelligence successfully. That's pretty good. OK, you did it. <laughs> Tyrone, what do you think? Are you, do you, you also want them to resist completely successfully? Um, so it's between Monica and, and Stevens is what you're asking. Yes. Me, basically, <laughs> like, take a side. Yes, and Sophie's one of them is present <laughs> right. and is really nice. <laughs> Um, I don't. I, I guess I don't know exactly what the word intelligence means in this in this poem because intelligence can incorporate indeterminacy too. Mm -hmm. It can incorporate both rationalism as well as irrationalism. So it's not. I'm not exactly sure what Stevens means by intelligence. Well, what there. if the distinction is between and it's a dumb distinction, but Stevens goes in for it once in a while between the intellect as in um, uh, as in a mind as opposed to heart, and uh, you know, thinking as opposed to feeling. What if it's that? And, and he's saying to himself, boy, oh boy, my art really needs to set thinking aside and let me feel more, but I can't always do it. Then you can't. That's not objectionable, is it? No, it's not, no. It's, I didn't have any objection the first time, but no, it's not. It's not objectionable. And in fact, it reminds me a great deal of Eliot's notion of the relationship between conscious, the poet, conscious control, and you know, unconscious. That somehow you have to establish a balance where you let the unconscious sort of take a subconscious. That's just like not unconscious. That would be a good trick, but the subconscious take over at, at various points. Um, but for my, but you're asking really about me, right? I am. Yeah. So, for myself, I would say, um, yeah, I would say, sometimes, sometimes, I give up. I'm willing to give up the intelligence entirely, but not always. So that's even more splitting <laughs> for you. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm thinking about the experience I had reading your book on spec which is um, very intellectual. But you know, the way you work with language is really, it seems to me, on the ground. It doesn't seem to me very, um, it's not driven by merely ideas. Um, right. Your language is very grounded. I love that book. On Spec, by the way, is his book, that one. Um, Alden, so I'm promoting you. <laughs> yes. <I> <laughs> Thank you. You get to check in the mail. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Alan, any thoughts on this before we turn to another poem? Well, the obvious, the bright obvious, I have very few hairs left to split. But um, throughout his work, and, and I really discovered this in school when I went back and read Shelley the same time I was reading Stevens, he uses the idea of the imagination much as Stevens, I mean, much as uh, uh, Shelley did. Almost as if it's a, uh, not only just another capacity, but almost as if it's a beam you can shine upon the world to try to grasp things. And he makes a, some distinctions between imagination and intelligence in, in that regard. But as to uh, something resisting the intelligence completely, almost completely, not at all, uh, to me it's a, a moot point because we're talking about language. Uh, you know, the, there's, whether we're talking about a good poem or even a, the crappiest poem you can imagine, there's always a moreness there. And there's always a resistance as a, anyone else picks up the thing and, and starts to read it, or in conversation even. Um, so there's simultaneously, there's always, I'm having it both ways too, there's always a resistance because we're talking about language, uh, but there's always that excess as well, and that's what makes communication possible in the first place. You know, it's a condition of possibility of our being able to speak to one another at all, that there is simultaneously resistance and apprehension. Thank you. Um Kate, you chose for one of your poems the motive for metaphor. I have three questions you can ask, answer any of them, excluding the others, if you like. 
Um, one is, I assume that the, I've always assumed about this poem that the motive for metaphor is this thing, like you don't really want to work with the thing itself, so you figure out an evasion, an, a likeness, a comparison, a metaphor, and that that motive is the same motive as avoiding the world directly. So that's an interesting issue. I don't know how that translates to a question, but how do you feel about that reading? Or what is the motive for metaphor for you as a writer? Um, my second question is referring to a stanza, and I'm not going to read the whole poem, but the stanza goes like this. The obscure moon lighting an obscure world of things that would never be quite expressed, where you yourself were never quite yourself and did not want nor have to be. Um, that strikes me as, for some people, a rather uh, depressing situation mm -hmm. of avoidance and evasion. But I think for Stevens is a very positive thing. So my question, I'll leave it at those two. My question would be, do you read it as a positive value? And do you agree as a poet about the importance of writing in such a way that, that uh, ambig ambiguity and obscurity create a not to be expressed, unsayable world in which you yourself are never quite yourself? Um. I read it as, as kind of a white flag um, where. Surrender. Yeah, or concession. Um, you know, I think what I love about this poem, and so many of these poems, and all of Stephen's poems, is they, um, they're sort of ars poetica that um, evince the poet's struggle to get at the, the thing itself. Right. and fail. Um, so here, I regard obscurity um, and inexactness and resistance mm -hmm. to intelligence as a positive quality of poetry. But I'm not certain that Stevens necessarily feels that way, but he does allow for it. Um, so I feel like in this, as in so many of, these, of his poems, um, he, he sort of pointing at trying to nail the thing, which is a, a urge that I have and continually has to, have to resist as a poet, because I might, I certainly lead with my intelligence um, and have to remind myself to uh, resist it or allow the poem to resist it. But he'll then sort of let a negative capability come into the poem and allow for the unknown and the failure so that's what's happening there to me. And does the role of self move you? Are you, are you taking that third line in that stanza seriously, where you yourself were never quite yourself? Does this sound familiar to you? Yes. Um, yes, to me, personally, um, where I also have to resist the urge to um, put myself in a one-to-one -one relationship with the speaker and the, you know, the various objects of the poem. Um, I don't think of Stevens as often being self-expressive um, in his <coughs> Could poem. that be a motive for metaphor, a fear of self-expression? It often is in poets, no? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Hmm. I think so. To translate the self in a kind of, um, I used this word before, but in a, in a slant way where um, there, the, there is no one-to-one -one relationship, or at least it can't hmm. be read that way by a, by a reader. Monica, you agree? Yes. Say more. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm, 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 I'm quite compelled in this poem by the fourth stanza, the desiring the exhilarations of changes, the motive for metaphor. Um, and so going back to the self, um, this idea that also goes back to man carrying thing, this idea that things might resist identity because once they, once they have a settled identity, they kind of um, cancel the workings of the imagination. Yeah. So 
it's in that labor and that approximation of the imagination towards the thing, the thing being either the landscape or the self, that the motive for metaphor lies. Mm. It's like that. I'm thinking also of the title of the other poem. Um, Reality is a product of the of most the august, august imagination. imagination. Yes, which highlights that, the work of the imagination. Translate that title into plain English. Reality is a product of what? Reality is the product of the most august imagination, the most robust imagination. So reality is not a given. It is actually, or the reality of the poem is a reality that is worked, worked toward through poetic activity. But indirectly, yeah. like through the. Yes. You can't go at it head on. Tyrone or Alden, motive for metaphor, any comments? Not just about the poem, but the poetic motive for metaphorization. Well, aside from a motive, I mean, I, that line, desiring the exhilarations of changes, that seems to be what's driving this particular poem is, is uh, this sort of um, delighting. Stephen's delighting in the fact that he can be many different people and many different, you know, right. have many different masks on. Um, and that serves, for him at least, that's one of the purposes of his art is to try on different, you know, roles, different masks. Yeah. Alden, you chose the man with the blue guitar. Yes, I did. And I have one question for you. Yeah. Well, it pref it's prefaced with this. This is a poem I've always, always admired. How many of you in the audience have read The Man with the Blue Guitar? So it's, it's just such an amazing poem because it's a variation poem, and he strums through it. And it's the closest he comes to improvisation, or at least the idea of improvisation. And oh no, he's got a blue guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Like a missile found in the mud. 
also for that young man, that scholar hungries for that book, the very book or less a page, or at the least, a phrase, that phrase, a hawk of life, that Latin phrase, to know, a missile for brooding sight, to meet that hawk's eye and to flinch, not at the eye, but at the joy of it. I play, but this is what I think. Nielsen and Tyrone Williams. So Alden. Bar mitzvahs and weddings. <laughs> How hard did you have to work, and maybe not at all, to see me? <laughs> that a blue guitar would be involved. <laughs> well, I know. I, now I know I picked it, and you're all yeah. in blue today. But the, the, I take this variationist idea here and the strumming pretty seriously. Yeah. And when I heard Tyrone reading reading it. I realize this thing really does have improvisational legs. Yeah. It really works. You want to comment on that? Well, uh, I'll probably have to divide this up into 20 responses for the, for the, the rest of the panel. But um, part of what we're doing here is not restoring a context, but providing a context that's waiting there in the poem and, and in Stevens. Elsewhere in one of his poems, he, he imagines a black Spaniard playing a guitar, for example. Obviously, we're bringing the blues into this, too. Um, at the core of this, though, and this has been a problem for me my whole life, is how do we contend with Stevens' racism? And we don't contend with it by erasing it. We don't contend with it by ignoring it. But we can contend with it by looking for the blackness that is already there in his work, particularly when you're talking about a Picasso painting in <laughs> Spain and, and those traditions and so forth and so on. In the 30s. Yeah. Now, two other things we can do. Uh, you know, um, one critic has talked about the ontological terrorism that you know is, that, is, is what you feel when you read some of those poems by, by Stevens. And some of you know that a couple of years ago, Major Jackson, at the beginning of his call for a discussion of race among <coughs> contemporary poets, began by citing that horrible moment when Stevens gives a racist insult regarding uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, but one thing that's interesting to do in that situation is to turn to see how various uh, black poets themselves are reappropriating Stevens, using Stevens. The most obvious example of this, of course, is Raymond Patterson's uh, 23 Ways of Looking at a Black Man. Um, but also, so I can mention this again, this new book by uh, Harmony Holiday, A Jazz Funeral for Uncle Tom, uh, contains a rather direct um, uh, example of the kind of thing I'm talking about when there's a piece called The Blackbird Singing or just after. Um, so, you know, these are just some of the ways I'm continuing with this. I'll, I'll end this part of it by just saying, years ago, in another context, I was teaching an essay by Patrocino Schweikert, which is looking at the issues of reading as a woman and how does a woman, particularly a feminist reader, uh, contend with, say, a Hemingway. And what Schweikert argues is that, you know, the, the kind of works that we feel this attraction to contain a sort of utopian kernel, which then they betray in one way or another. And the betrayal of that utopianism in a Stevens is every bit as interesting, I think, as, as anything else. And it gives us a platform from which to, to go off and try to do other things with Stevens that they'll never correct what he did, but they can bring us into our time. I'm stumbling now, so we'll go on. Yeah, no, that's really <laughs> good. Who wants to follow up on that? Tyrone, any thoughts on what Alan just said? Uh, no. <laughs> Monica, Kate? Yeah. Well, I, for me, um, that racism really comes out in the many places where he's playing with foreign languages and foreign names. Um, we were talking about this earlier, Mrs. Papadopoulos, um, which, you know, is such a wonderful name and is really like, the way that poem ends is, is so, Funny so and, and lovely, so but he, on her couch. Couch. Right. Yeah. he is he is making fun of her name to a degree, and he spends you know in so many of his poems he's sort of like riffing on the sounds of Arabic. Um, he uses a lot of um, characters with Spanish names um, to produce certain effects within the poems. Um, so you know we have to to reread and recontextualize those things 
now um, and look at the effects he was intending to create because they're questionable. Maybe, uh, can I ask something? Please. So, So my question would be like if, say, Man with the Blue Guitar is riffing off of some procedures he um, learned from the blues, does highlighting that structure, that improvisational structure, make him more racist or less racist? Well, neither, neither in my mind. You know. Right. <laughs> no, yeah, I just, I just, I'm curious about what, what contextualizing the work in that way does for his position Well, regarding a, race. A couple of things in the critical discussion about these issues, you know, the comment about not being invited to be Stevensians at Stevens uh, uh, conferences. Back in the mid 80s, when I first wrote about this, the Wallace Stevens Journal wanted no part of it. It made it very clear to me they didn't want to hear from me ever again if I was going to talk about these issues. But that has to do with historical context. I mean, the, the kinds of issues I was trying to raise and, and the fact of the decontextualizing of those issues in most subsequent Stevens criticism, even, even right up to today. Now, what I meant to say to start out with is what we did here was kind of an experiment to see just how true the basic premise of the poem is, which is that things are changed on the blue guitar. We changed Stevens. Obviously, he knew about the blues, but he was not thinking of that kind of blues when he was writing this poem. So we're, that's why I said about we're expanding and, and mm -hmm. shifting the context as we're doing it. So we're, we're sort of creating new Stevenses all the time. And I think we can create some more useful Stevenses if we don't ignore certain aspects. Yeah, of here, here. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just throw out, uh, before I turn to one of Tyrone's poems, um, the poem I chose for this uh, conversation was No Possum, No Sop, No Taters. That poem is about wintry barrenness. Stevens referred to the quote unquote poverty of the imagination, and he didn't mean economic poverty or precarity of any kind, actual precarity. He meant impoverishment, meaning what Williams meant when he talked about, sadly, about citizens of Patterson, New Jersey having, experiencing impoverished imaginations. Um, and he was hoping, as Stevens was, for a flourishing of the imagination. So he does his snowman thing in this, in this uh, World War II era poem, No Possum, No Sop, No Tater, snowman being an early poem. In, snow, in the snowman, he imagines a barren place where the uh, subject of the poet, emptied of consciousness, could see things as if he had no mind. Right, kind of a Zen move, and it's pretty cool, and everybody teaches it. When you get to no possum, no sop, no taters, it's exactly the same poem, except for the title, mm -hmm. and that title is extremely disconcerting, mm -hmm. in exactly the way that the jar in Tennessee is, is disconcerting when it's Tennessee, a slovenly wilderness, quite an assumption about Tennessee. And the assumption there is that the jar, which is standing for modern form, can take dominion. It can colonize Tennessee. So he uses his little bit of business travel experience in Tennessee to say something about the modern form and how nature can't hold up to it. So it's a pro. It's a pro-jar poem. <laughs> uh, it's all, all up with jar, down with nature. Pretty modern thing. Everybody signs on to it. Even spring and all is about that. But no possum, no sop, no taters, the title. It drives me crazy, because is it Connecticut during a time of World War II rationing privation? No possum, I don't think, even in rural Connecticut, is being served at the tables. This is, this is a reference to impoverished Appalachia, no doubt. Um, is it funny? Does it take the snowman and update it to a time of actual economic privation? Not sure, but the title gives me pause. And it's sort of a larger, a, a larger category of offensiveness in Stevens. And yet what he's hoping for in the end is some modicum of empathy. And the last two lines, after all this wintriness and everybody's isolated and cold and, and really not very human at this point, he says, last two lines, one joins him there for company. The, the him is a crow in a tree, right? And it's sort of hunkering down against the coldness of the winter. One joins him there for company, but at a distance in another tree. So this, this impulse to say, I, I think I, with my wintriness, will join you up there 
and maybe we can hunker down against the wind together. But no, really what I'm going to do is I want to try out um, coldness in a tree across the way. It's as close as he gets to empathy. But I give him some credit for having a poem in, in, in this context in which the speaker finally wants to join. In The Snowman, not at all. So we could call it a modest step forward. Anyway, that's sort of a follow-up. Um, Tyrone theory. It's a poem not talked about much. Um, why did you pick it? Uh, is this theory as you know it? Uh, what kind of theoretical position is it? And why'd you pick it? Um, this is short enough, maybe you can read it. OK. Um, well, that's one of the reasons I picked it, because you said pick a short poem. <laughs> so, you win. This is one of the shorter ones. <laughs> theory. I am what is around me. Women understand this. One is not duchess, a hundred yards from a carnage. Carriage. Sorry, from a carriage. <laughs> carriage. <laughs> but that's <laughs> telling <laughs> itself. This uh, American carnage. Is this American carnage. We're remaking Stevens we're right remaking, here. Exactly, exactly. I guess I should put my glasses on, but maybe not. <laughs> These then are portraits, a black vestibule, a high bed, sheltered by curtains, these are merely instances. So I, as I said, I picked it because it was short. Um, I also picked it because I felt it was very obtuse, and therefore there wouldn't be a lot of questions directed <laughs> toward me about it. Um, but I think it's also, it's, I also think of it as a typical, for me at least a typical Stevens poem. Um, and in fact, following up on your discussion of the previous poem, that first line, I am what is around me, is an interesting statement in that, in that regard, because here there is this sense of, of um, not even connection, but in fact, it's complete seamlessness between the I and the context of that I. I am what is around me. But then, of course, that's immediately undercut by the very next line. And I know you said don't do many lectures, but OK. Women understand this. So immediately, then, um, we have in that next you know, line that follows at least a kind of qualification of the first line to a certain extent. Mm. Um, because of, among other things, it makes you question what, the nature of the eye. For example, it's, it's, it would be easy to imagine that the eye is male, but what if the eye is female? For example, then how does that second line read? Women understand this. In that case, it's self-reflective, if you imagine the first, that the eye is female. Um, if not, then it's kind of a typical Williams kind of almost nastiness in a sense, you know, where women understand these sort of things that men don't understand. Kate, Monica, when you mm. chatted about these poems, what, what did you think about theory? Mm. Did you make anything of it? We, oh, all we kinds were. of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had a good conversation. First around the I. So is that I, is that I the self, the generic self, mm. or is it himself? And then I think what you just said, yeah, the next statement, women understand this, undercuts it, but also in a way make the, the, the second line of the poem enacts what is stated in the first line. Because if, if that eye is, is the eye of women, then yes, I is what is around me. Mm -hmm. Like it's being qualified by what, by what is around the line. Mm. So I find that really interesting. But we said something about, uh, and, and Okay, you'll jump in in a minute. But uh, this idea that maybe there's an essentializing notion of what femininity is about. So mm -hmm. the self is vacant and is empty and is only uh, in relation to whatever is around it and in relation to the roles that have been assigned, et cetera. So it's this emptiness that's only qualified by context. And women understand this because, of course, women are nothing until they're qualified by what's around them, usually the patriarchy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I read the first line as an inversion of Descartes, like, um, mm -hmm. I am all but what I am. Mm 
essentially. Um, and I, I don't know, I give them the benefit of the doubt on women understand this, because I do yeah. understand that. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. So like, I, I am my accessories, um, like a carriage in this case. Putting Descartes in front of the horse. <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. Wow. <laughs> The last poem had the line, the bad is final in this light, and I didn't even... <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, Kate. I'm sorry. Oh, nothing. I, uh, and the other thing I noticed about this poem is that it's structured like a syllogism. Um, mm-hmm. Like, it, you know, I am what is around me. Um, a person is relational, as Monica said. And then he he equates uh, the, what is around a, a person, the person's context with a portrait, with portraiture. And then the third piece is that a portrait is inc- incidental and changing, and therefore a person is in- incidental and changing. Mm. So again, I keep going back to this, but it sort of skirts, or it, it sort of um, illustrates this poet's struggle to, to want to, um, to, really like get at the essence of a thing but only be able to to circle it and sort of um, demarcate the, the space of it in a lot of ways mm-hmm. and a syllogism perfectly illustrates that it's like a you know a, a cyclical um, motion or in a mm-hmm. like a just coming a repetitive struggle Tyrone Allen what's the title mean I was going to go back to this. <laughs> um, as it happens, this morning I attended a panel on auto theory. Uh, with G.V. Shockley spoke on uh, auto theory and feminist writing, in her case particularly looking at um, black feminist uh, writing. And several people made the point, you know, this was not the main point, it was just underscoring an obvious thing that, that again, there is no outside of a theoretical anything. Mm-hmm. So we can read this as a theory. We can read this as theory more generalized. Again, he was with the, given his philosophical bit. That would make sense. Um, and we can read this in this odd, contradictory, day, Cartesian sense too. Because if I am what's around me, and my portrait is me in a black vestibule, <laughs> or if I am what's around me, and my portrait is me in a high bed surrounded by curtains, mm-hmm. I am those things. But you can't really see much of of anything. So he seems to be, to the extent that this is a theory, and, and I'm glad you mentioned Williams because this is so much like Williams in those last several lines. Mm-hmm. If it is a theory of something, it's a theory that says, as so many of his poems do, that I am chameleon-like sort of what is my context, my environment, and so forth and so on. But at the same time, it's saying that for that very reason, you're not going to be able to see me very well. <laughs> you know. Well, a theory is a thing uh, to be tested, and it, this reads to me like the test. It's both the theory and the test. It's like the yeah. test of itself. Yeah. In another poem, we have that line, just pages of illustrations. <laughs> right, and, and mm-hmm. pages of illustrations. That's a great point, Alan, because these are merely instances mm-hmm. is that rhetorical out that he sometimes uses to say, well, you know, I could go on, but you get it. Yeah. Or to totally ironize. Mm-hmm the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, How generally, before we turn to the next poem, how generally do you all deal with Stephen's habit of ironizing some of the most serious thoughts to the point where you just say, okay, if you're not going to take it seriously, why should I take (laughs) it seriously? Does anybody have that feeling sometimes? And maybe this is something about the high modernists generally that only takes you so far. Mm -hmm. Well, we've supposedly been post-ironic for, what, 18 years now? Uh, it doesn't seem to be working. Well, the end, <laughs> you know? at the end of irony, you're thinking of 9-11 was yeah, yeah. only about Well, that's what it was pronounced. Say, but yeah. uh, but at, you know, at any rate, uh, you know, irony is inescapable. Um, he's less that way here than he is in The Comedian is the Letter C in some of the, the earlier poems. Right. Uh, but I think he recognizes the inescapable of irony. And again, this is a conditional of, of possibility of our being able to speak to one another at all. You know, our, our words have to be polysemous or we can't have communication. So the irony is always going to be there. Um, it's the difference between someone telling a funny joke and someone telling, doing a fart joke. You know, um, he does both. 
I don't think that's ever been said about Wallace. <laughs> Tyrone, you're, you look like you have a thought. Uh, no, I, I think of this as I, I think of this poem also illustrating the same kind of distances that we've seen before. Um, one is not. I mean, that line, one is not duchess, which I take in at least two different ways, a hundred yards uh, from a car carriage, um, that to be a duchess is in, implies a duke, for one thing. So one cannot be just, there has to be at least two things. It's, a very, it's about relations, you know, that the notion of duchess depends upon the notion of duke and vice mm -hmm. versa. Um, Was this but, his last duchess? Oh, boy. It's the elf. <laughs> the elf. 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 And if it's about the muse, then, whoa, who's speaking the poem? Is the muse doing this, solilo is this the solilo soliloquy of the interior paramour? Who's speaking? Um, I believe the paramour is interior to the poet, or to the speaker. Um, I've never understood it as a second person in the room. Um, and it reads, it does read like a late career poet. Mm -hmm. um, Can you pick out a few phrases or lines that say late career poet? Um, well, it's evening. Mm -hmm. um, there's a shawl. <laughs> there's a shawl. Um, <laughs> there's some candles in the dark. Uh, <laughs> it feels like the, and the last line is, being there together is enough, as though something has been come to terms with, um, kind of wrestled out and made peace with. Um, but the whole motion of the poem, to me, feels like um, kind of uh, the poet like sort of contending with his own hermeticism and like cooking down, mm -hmm. in a sense, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of self-melding into this state of completion and letting that be enough. Mm. So what happened to, if the interior paramour used to be muse-like inspiration, whatever it is inside that gets you to write the poem, what's happened to it now? Um, Here now we forget each other and ourselves. <laughs> That's yeah, great. What, what, what she said. And that is the future. The avatar reading Stevens is the future. Here now we forget each other and ourselves. We feel the obscurity of an order, a whole, a knowledge. That which arranged past tense, the rendezvous. I'm, yeah, I lost track of your question. So did I. What's, <laughs> what is the future of inspiration for this poet if this is the end of the separation of the source of poetry and the poet? Or they become one and being together is enough. Are there any poems in his future? Seemingly not. That seems to be the stance. This is it. Well, he, you know, the title to me, Final Soliloquy, suggests that he's lost his audience, that there's no longer a separation between right. the poet and whoever is receiving the poetry, even if that receiver is, inside, is interior to the, to the poet mm -hmm. himself, in this case. Um, so I don't know what to say about that. I think it's sort of a, um, it's hard not to read uh, some loss of impetus to to keep on going and keep writing and trying to affect this um, relationship with the with the world and the and the language um, <laughs> in here. He just it's, it, it it I feel there's a palpable weariness to it, mm -hmm. um, as though the poet were saying, I, "I've done enough. I've said enough. I am tired of this struggle to." you know, depict 
um, and I'm going to let myself fall together and stop, um, I don't know, trying to maintain a, um, a distance from my, my object and my right. intent. And yet, every time he contemplates this in the late poems, we get a poem. Mm -hmm. So he seems to be generating poems out of this thought. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the end, you know, it, he, he wants this place where being there together is enough. That's it. Final. Game over. Right. And yet the enough, the being there together enough is, you know, is enough. the poem. Right. The poem has, yes. uh, evinces that or uh, manifests. Um, I could ask all four of you, uh, do any of the poems that we're talking about or others speak to you as a poet when you contemplate a new poem? or new poetry, I'll start by asking you about this one. Does this poem speak to you in your either anxieties about what the next thing is going to be, um, source of inspiration? Monica? Uh, not really. However, I am, I am very interested in the personification of this other thing that the mind is engaging with. And more than that, on the erotics of it. I mean, the language is so bizarre. The interior paramour, this is the intensest rendezvous. They're in a room. You used They're the word room. onanism earlier. I used, Wait, yes, Sharon, so, <laughs> a single shawl tap, wrapped tightly around us. If that us is just the usual royal singular for Stevens, then he's got the shawl in the interior. But it suggests a couple. But that couple, but but the, if the paramour is interior, then it's the mind contemplating itself, and that is the erotic relationship, the very onanistic relationship, that is posited here is the love affair between the poet and his construction. Um, and so, even though it's a po poem that perhaps is about this weariness and that manifests a poet in a, in a later um, stage of their career, pondering the, the end and the final soliloquy, I think the fact that that erotic language is used so forcefully. And so, I mean, you, you see it elsewhere, like in the, in, 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 in the Man with the Blue Guitar, <coughs> when there's talk about a universal intercourse, that's also very erotic. Um, so I think, I think that eroticism rubs off and then becomes the thing that actually meant that is the engine of the poem. So even though it's about that, it's about mining the, 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 the sexual potential, or the, yeah, the, the yeah. erotic potential in the act of contemplating. In The Man with the Blue Guitar, the erotic potential is the lovers, the two lovers, the rea reality and the imagination, mm -hmm. um, having a duet with The Undertaker. Uh, yeah. And it is somewhat sexualized. Um, Tyrone Alden, does this, this Stevens speak to you as a poet? Monica just said, no, not really. Well, not, and, and maybe I didn't finish my, my thought, but I did, I, not really because, because for me the poem, even though it is about whatever is being produced by my imagination, the act of writing a poem, and that discovery, I do see it as a portal towards someone, some, something else that's beyond me. Mm. I, don't, I don't just like, yeah, maybe, I mean, of course that engagement with myself is important, otherwise I wouldn't write. And yeah. yet, once I can suspend that, I've gotten to where I want to go. No. <laughs> no. Say more. Um, Please. I just, it's not, I mean, that line um, in the next to last stanza, we, uh, we say God and the imagination are one. You know, that's, you know, it's the final sort of Death Star kind of thing for Stevens. That's not, I, you know, it's alien to my own sensibilities and so forth. So that thing that's very important to him, the supreme fiction, you know, poetry shall take the place of God, right. not your thing at all. Right. And it's not the thing of most contemporary poets, certainly not experimental poets. Yeah, Kate, Alden? Well, you know, more generally, I've been responding to Stevens my whole life. Uh, directly, one of my poems is titled An Ordinary Evening in New Haven, for example has to do with having dinner with my wife in New Haven. My wife and I have never eaten dinner in New Haven, so it's important to know that. 
So um, it's a supreme fiction. Then. Well, I have another poem called The Supreme. Well, I don't know if New Haven can ever be a supreme right. fiction. But. I, I have another poem called The Supreme's Fiction, which is, in fact, about Diana Ross. Uh, another poem that's very much out of these questions about the mind and imagination that uh, is called Descending Summit Avenue. This poem in particular is more of a matter of a negative reaction, which we're kind of hearing here, too, in that I've never shared this obsession with you know the central mind, the major man. Mm -hmm. um, something being at the end of something, you know, that's just never uh, appealed to me. Right. But on the other hand, you know, I've, I've always been more Williams than Stevens, but um, to me in the same way that everything that interests me in the 20th century has roots in Whitman and Dickens and everything that interests me coming out of modernism is probably going through Williams and Stevens in, in one way or another. The, the philosophy in Stevens, the expression in Williams probably. Although Williams is a very philosophical poet, I don't want to deny that either. So all of this is you know, part of my work. Uh, I tend not to be responding, except for that one about New Haven, to a, a particular poem, mm -hmm. uh, but more uh, the general trend of the thought and the, the aesthetics that, it, that are involved. Um, and I'm not alone. You know, I've always said that from Stephen, from the comedian is the letter C, you get things like Ashbery. Uh, from Snowman, you get people like Mark Strand. But all of us are in, coming out of here in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm even though we probably find many of his ideas reprehensible. <laughs> we're going to go into a lightning round. You didn't know you were going to do this. Nope. No. OK. We're going to go down the line. I'm included. The first time, you're going to say one thing very briefly about Stevens that interests you, that, that, keep, that creates keen interest in you, or something that you may not do as a poet but admire or think is remarkable. And I'm thinking about where we're going to start. You want to start down there? Start with you. You said you're going to do it yourself, so start. OK, I'll start. I get to start. OK. Um, this thing that Kate and I were talking about a few minutes ago, at the end of his life, he is really good at understanding his limits. And when he imagines the end of the imagination, he's always imagined how it cannot help but be rekindled. He wakes up again and says, Oh, wait a minute. I just imagined the end of the imagination. I've got an imagination after all. And he continues. And that series of poems where he's just about gone and then awakens to something very vital, uh, the palm at the end of the mind, is just a st stunning, striking move. Pathetic poems like Long and Sluggish Lines at so much more than 70, he begins, which is now you know, thought of as very young, but he died at 76 or something, and he was slowing down at 70. At so much more than 70, I can't even write lines that end anymore. I don't have any. And he writes this brilliant long-lined poem, and then he says, wow, I can still do this. And he finds some, the, you know, not ideas about the thing, but the thing itself is about ideas about the thing, even after everything's been reduced. So I think that as an an elderly poet, as a poet of age, he is superb at finding energy left. The man, the poem that took the place of a mountain is partly that as well. Okay. I would add to that. Please add to it. Yeah, I well, I'm going to. Lightning that. round, though. That was not very lightning. Well, my so. lightning is thunder. to <laughs> that was thunder. agree with you um, that what I love about Stevens is the kind of strange loops of his of his poems mm -hmm. where they, um, you know, they, they bring about what they already are. Right. Um, and so there's, um, and in particular, and I know you're all not privy to like this particular pile of poems, but there's an iterative quality to these poems where he's like trying again and trying again and trying again to make a thing be rather than just say what it's mm. trying to be. Mm. Um, and it does succeed in being something, but what it succeeds in being is what, what his effort mm. in the first place. Mm. Cool. <clears throat> Monica. I, 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 as skeptical as I might have sounded before, I do love how seriously he entertains the notion of thought as being the substance of poetry and his attentiveness to how language substantiates thought is really interesting to me. When we had the conversation about the poem that takes the place of the mountain, you mentioned Borges, and I'd never really made that connection, but there's so many correspondences actually between Borges and him. Like the fruits of 
intellect of, of, of the act of imagination as, as being these poems, these things that exceed it. And his attentiveness to the wrestling and this contention between the, th the idea of the thing and the thing as an idea, as he talks about in so-and-so reclining on her couch. I love that about it, uh, about his poetry, his body work, and, and his language, and the clarity and luminosity to it. It's really something to contend with. Thank you. Tyrone? Um, well, I, I, I guess I think of Steve, as I mentioned this earlier in our conversation before this, um, that I think of Stevens, I can't think, it's hard for me to think of Stevens in and of himself. As a, mm -hmm. I always think in terms of the period of time, uh, other writers um, like Wordsworth and Tennyson that I, I mentioned earlier. And so for, for me, you know, his work is, you know, is uh, merely an instance mm. of uh, a general, <laughs> shall we say, climate and, 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 um, and poetics that, um, yeah, I mean, that, you know, that a world that's disappearing, and I, I have to say I don't feel regret for that world disappearing, mm -hmm. that world that he belongs to. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Alan. Uh, a couple of quick lightning bolts. Uh, I love the accidents of publication. So we were just talking about the final soliloquy, which is followed by a poem that begins with the heading 70 years later. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I love the severe epistemology that's with him from his student days with Santiana and others. I love that part. I don't always love the expression of it. Um, so for example, in that poem that starts 70 years later, it is an illusion that we were ever alive, or the sounds of the guitar were not and are not. Those. Part of my problem is I've been allergic my whole life to the whole concept of the unsayable, which I get said over and over again at the MLA. And there's too many times when he's sort of pointing at something that can't be said. Well, he we keeps saying things about it over and over and over again. <laughs> that part I don't like so much. But the part about you know, the, uh, trying to use the imagination to understand how the world of things appears in our consciousness, that I find really interesting. I want to take a few questions from the audience in the time that remains. And um, if you, do, you be aware that we're filming, so if you're asking a question, it sort of implies that you're OK being filmed in asking it. So question for our poets about their response to Stevens. Yes. I want to go back to the idea. Speak loudly, though, because mm -hmm. we're catching the audio. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the question of the intelligence and the poetry resisting the intelligence. And I mean, I taught Stevens to undergrad last year, and we spent a lot of time. I mean, I recognize this tendency to try to figure everything out mm -hmm. and kind of translate everything into into prose, and that seems to be a way in which the intelligence is trying to colonize or capture the poem. But on the other hand, it always seemed that the poem does resist that. It does, you can't, I mean, just by virtue of can't the poem, paraphrase. but also mm. it's very difficult poetry. And mm. there, it seems like there's always this ambiguity and obscurity that, that outdoes out the, the, the uh, you know, paraphrase, mm -hmm. at least. So, I wonder if even the phrase, the, the poem should resist the intelligence almost successfully. I mean, it's more like, I mean, it's an aphorism. Mm -hmm. And even the aphorism has something in it and about it that at least resists paraphrase. So I'm inclined to go back to the idea that intelligence is more than just, like, it has to be able to encompass the ambiguity of the, of the poem and that they're more in a kind of, um, uh, kind of prolonged tension with one another. So mm -hmm. I don't know if this sounds Somebody right. want to respond to that? More of a comment than a question. Mm -hmm. but like Monica? Uh, well, I was thinking of things in the poems that resist uh, uh, being subsumed or deployed in the, uh, the for, for, for that, 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 that resist being supporting agents in the unified theory of the poem. As, 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 a, as a poem that, that's presenting a propositional um, syllogism to contend with. Sorry, that was really long-winded. What I'm thinking, there's, al there's always elements that are like 
why is this there? Like, for instance, in this poem, Man Carrying Thing, the use of the word brun, like a brun figure in winter evening resists identity. Why brun and not just gray or brown or <laughs> hazy? Like, so it, it just seems like so idiosyncratic, his use of certain terminology, or the word practique in one of the poems, and he, he, he spells that with a CK at the end. And, and it seems to defy a, ration, a clear rationale. So even he, in articulating these thoughts, is actually resisting them by including things that seem totally random. Because another thing would have, would have served the purpose of the poem. I love that. It's like those, those um, idiosyncratic uses of vocabulary, or he, I think he often um, sort of uh, resuscitates um, old like la retired language and mm -hmm. you know, strange <laughs> vocabulary and it's mm -hmm. almost they almost there's something in Stevens that invites for me or asks me to figure the poem out like it's a puzzle and find the answer and figure out how to mm -hmm. like to say what it means and those strange um, moments of vocabulary are almost like reminders or signposts or like stop signs saying, wait, don't forget, this is a poem. This is right. not a normative use of language or logic. Mm -hmm. um, not normative, a, you know, a um, prosaic use of logic. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think, that, okay. Um, I think about the, when I think of him, I think about the man with the secret identity and the secret life who was composing the poems while we're walking to work in a job where people did not know who he was. They did not know. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, and so even like the wordplay and the sounds going through his head mm -hmm. and composing the poems that way and just kind of like laughing at himself. I just, I think about that. But I'm just, there's a lot, you're having a lot of consensus in your readings of the poems. And I guess I just am wondering, um, like beyond the harsh poetic job, readings, like how much room do you think there is for other readings, like other figurative um, mm -hmm. readings of the poem? How would you and for dis describe our re we, we, before we came here, we spent almost an hour talking about the poem that took the place of a mountain. And I don't think there was consensus about that. Can, you, can anybody describe how the four of us, five of us, responded differently or distinctly to that, Alan? Well, I was going to say something entirely different in response to that. I got a, a sharp lesson of that when I began teaching uh, San Jose State the first time I ever taught Anecdote of the Jar. And I'm you know, there with my usual modernist stuff and epistemological stuff. Every single student read that as an environmentalist statement. I had never heard a single student do that before. The poem, the text had not changed, but the consensus was changing around it very clearly. As it were. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as, it, as it ever shall be. But, but really, but I'm it, interested it, in. The people at his job did know about the poetry. His secretary yeah. typed them up. <laughs> you know? Yeah, especially toward the end, they did. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really interested in how we can report to these folks what it was like to spend an hour together, five different points of view on this particular poem. We didn't totally reconcile those points of view. Monica, how did we, what, what happened? <laughs> did we agree in the end? I think we did agree in the end, didn't did we? we? I think we did. But we didn't agree at the beginning. So the product of the mm. conversation was like, but, but, but what we agreed on was something very complex that had multiple sides to it and, 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 and was so multifaceted that it really could not be paraphrased. I think. But I think yeah. the gist of what's being said, and I think Tyrone's been uh, most forceful about it, is that um, even that poem, the poem that took the place of mountains, is a pretty dazzling idea. We all had misgivings about certain ideas mm -hmm. that he had there, yes. uh, about retrospect, about looking back at one's own writing, about the tricks he was playing on himself and on us. And yet we came away after 45 minutes of talking about it respecting what he was accomplishing in his own terms. I think that's what's happening with Wallace Stevens. If he has, if he has anything to say to four contemporary poets, all of them amazing poets, you know, it's a, as Alden has said, it's a kind of a pick and choose thing. He's there for you. 
Um, I do think we, sorry, did I interrupt you? No, I just wanted to ask you, what do you mean by consensus? Because I think what you're saying is that we all kind of agree on the poems, but are you saying we agree with, with Stevens's take on? No, I think, I think that, that explained it, it, the fact that you had had the discussion. So, so what we're hearing is, you know, not the first time. Mm. I guess I'm not sure about what, that. What I was going to say is, and, and when this is online, you can all see this. At the beginning of our reading that poem, uh, each of us had sort of different ideas about the temporality of it, who was looking at what, and so forth and so on. Right. And this is why we left to talk about poems. It wasn't so much that we all came to agree with each other in the end, but we, we heard each other and began seeing things a little bit differently, mm -hmm. in the same way that every time you read a good poem, you see it a little bit differently. And I, I think that's kind of magical. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. But uh, we, Kate was going to say something. Well, I was just going to say we have tended to, and this is a tendency of, of mine, read all of these poems as like little self-reflexive machines that are sort of producing their own effects. Um, but you, they can also be read differently. Like they point at all kinds of things outside their selves and their the moments of their creation. But I think we have sort of tended to to look at them that mm -hmm. way. And that might be a contemporary tendency to a degree. But I think it also has to do with the choice of the poems that we, that we discussed and, and our picks. Because there's one poem that we didn't talk about, except there we were two mentioned it, but yeah, two. Yeah. So so-and-so reclining on her couch begins with uh, the mention of the painting of a, someone who was painted at 21, has no, ling no, no lineage, no language. And then at the end of the poem, he ends with this very glib, thanks, Mrs. No. Goodbye, Goodbye Mrs. Mrs. Papadopoulos, Papadopoulos and, and thanks. thanks. And so when we're discussing this poem, first Kate and I were talking about the poem, and we were thinking, she thought so-and-so reclining on her couch and Mrs. Papadopoulos could be the same person. And I think it's not the same person, but if we all looked at that poem together, there's enough evidence in the poem that it could be the same person or it could not be the same person. I, I don't think consensus is possible in that poem, actually. And I love that about that poem. And I also love that these women in the poem seem to be making an ass out of Stevens and resisting his imposition of his intelligence or the intelligence of the poem onto them. Um, and that's what's really, it's, it's a really unusual poem, also because there's people in it. It's one of the short poems with people in it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, anybody who knows my work around, you know, active public work in poetry, it's all poem-based. The work that I do is poem-based, partly as a way of cutting things down to manageable pieces. And I think one of the benefits of dealing Stevens this way, it's just been said, is despite our general misgivings about certain tendencies of his modernism and some blindnesses and ignorance, um, when you get a poem, you can, and, and you realize it's not yet another self-referential machine, but is doing something here or there or there, you begin to see things. And I think the five of us saw this poem this afternoon, uh, the, the poem that took the place of the mountain, is an example of the power of poetry and of poetic sensibilities addressing themselves seriously and unironically to figuring it out together collaboratively. That's really cool. If Stevens is a means by which we do that, then Stevens works. Mm -hmm. um, and we can go around and say, I can't stand Stevens, and I did one MLA panel on Stevens, and I want nothing more to do with Stevens. But you know, there's a poem in your pocket, and the next time you think about this idea of retrospective, you might actually bring Stevens up. Yes, sir, you wanted to say something? Yeah? yeah um, I have just a couple comments and a question. Uh, the class issue with Stevens, I think, is so obvious in No Sop, No Possum, No Sop, No Tater. But also in theory, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because it, it's kind of like Bourdieu's notion of habitus. I mean, mm -hmm. he's listing in each one of those instances things which define you in terms of a class position. And this mm -hmm. was the poet who Gertrude Stein joked about the fact that he was the button down sort of Brooks Brothers um, fellow um, when he's hanging out with Duchamp and company. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that the class issue with language is the same. It becomes mm -hmm. a sort of accoutrement of mm -hmm. class that he sends his secretary down to Hartford Library to look up words in the OED. <laughs> and so, in a sense, mm. you know, it's like that 
theme for English B, you know, we are, I, I am what I see and feel and hear, I don't want to see you. And, mm -hmm. and, but he sees that in a, in a kind of class um, situatedness, and he wants to be distanced mm -hmm. from the no-self, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one joins him there for company. Well, not really. I join him in another tree, and I'm <laughs> across the way. I don't really want to be in contact. But, uh, the, 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 I have two questions. One for you is, what do you think in motive or metaphor of that X at the end? Uh, how, did, how did you think about that? Um, so that was one. The other one was, uh, I think, when we talked at the earlier poems about you know resisting the intelligence, it reminds me so much of, of the Frost poem, For Once and Something, in which looking down, it's this self-reflective act where I'm, you know, I'm trying to read in the depths and what he sees is his own self, godlike, um, in this Hendeka selection. He only has a moment where he sees what he thinks but is the truth. But he doesn't know what it is. It could be trivia or truth. You know, he says it's a pebble of quartz or truth. And mm -hmm. it, it's that sort of the intelligence wanting it to mean when he says in his, uh, on various occasions, you know, poem doesn't have to mean anything. It has all these other sort of material elements mm. to go with it. Let's ask yes. Kate to respond to the end of um, the motive for metaphor, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, well, to me, that reads like a, um, a variable in a mathematical equation. And um, this poem is, is kind of an illustration of that idea of um, resisting the intelligence and allowing for slippage between the mind and the world and language and allowing those things in and also just allowing them uh, to exist and allowing the self to be OK with them and not um, reaching after an X and finding something that is, or, or trying to create a one-to-one -one relationship between the language and reality. Um, so that whole last stanza of that poem, the ruddy temper, the hammer of red and blue, the hard sound steel against intimation, the sharp flash, the vital, arrogant, fatal, dominant X has this kind of like blacksmith you know, banging on an anvil, mathematical precision um, uh, quality to it. And it's that that he's, you see him resisting, but also yearning for kind of that in all of these poems. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank the four colleagues, poets. And the man with the blue guitar, thank you for that performance down there, man with blue guitar, man with blue hat. Uh, and Chris Martin and Zach Cardner, who recorded this program. Yeah. And my friends at the Wallace Student Society, we, we will be putting this out. Uh, uh, at some point, there'll be a poem talk episode about the man, sorry, about the poem that took the place of the mountain and the video here. But if you're interested in seeing it soon or want an excerpt from it, you can just contact me. The last name is Phil Reese, and I'm the only Phil Reese in the academy that I know of, so a Google search will find me. <laughs> Thank you once again for coming tonight.